today we are here to talk about yet another session of uh, the MCQ discussion with the PGI. So let me just check if I'm online and I'll be starting very very soon guys. So hi, welcome to the class. So can I have a thumbs up of all of you who are watching at this particular moment? Can I please have a thumbs up guys? I hope I'm visible and audible to you properly. Just give me a thumbs up. Right. So hi, I am Dr. Pavan Kandhari and today we are here to talk about the PGI MCQs. Can I please have a thumbs up guys? Whoever is watching me online, can I please have a thumbs up? Okay. I just want a thumbs up guys, whoever is watching me online, can I please have a thumbs up? Right, so, okay, so let's begin with today's session. Uh, Right. So today we are here to talk about our next uh, particular session on the PGI, which is uh, MCQ session on the PGI. So which of the following statements is uh, true regarding regarding the hypertrophic scar is false. So here we are going to talk about the hypertrophic scar, guys. OK, so which of these particular statements is false? Can you please have a response from you? Whoever is watching me online, can you please answer this particular question? Which of the following statements regard the hypertrophic scar is false? So let us take it one by one. So there is an increased deposition of the collagen type 3. Is it a true statement or a false statement? So if we just consider this particular statement that there is an increased deposition of the collagen type 3. Is it a true or a false statement? So can I please have an answer guys? So yes, please understand this is in fact a true statement. Okay. So yes, there is in fact increased deposition of a collagen type 3. This is in fact a true statement. What about collagen is disorganized? So can you please tell, uh, is it disorganized or is it kind of uh, kind of arranged in a organized fashion? So I can see that we have a couple of uh, viewers at this particular moment. Can you please try to answer this particular question? Uh, is it uh, like option number B we are talking about? So is the collagen disorganized? Is it a true or a false statement? Now please understand, this is a very very important difference between a hypertrophic scar and a keloid. Okay, so in the hypertrophic scar, whatever the kind of a collagen is there, it is basically organized in a regular fashion. So there is a regular arrangement of a kind of a collagen in this particular patient but here we do not have a disorganized pattern but if at all we talk about the kind of a keloid in that we get a kind of this disorganized pattern so i hope you got this in this particular patient we will have a regular arrangement or a regular arrangement of a collagen but in a patient of a keloid we will have a disorganized arrangement of the collagen i hope you get this now what about this? Is there any kind of a predisposition to the ethnicity in these particular patients? Is there any predisposition to the ethnicity? Is it a true or a false statement? So like uh, option number C, is it a true or a false statement guys? Can you please tell me? Uh, right. Hi Maya. Can you please tell me what is option number C? Is it a true or a false statement? Is it a true statement? Okay. Right. Now, yes, definitely. C is true statement. Okay. Yes, it is a true statement. Now, please understand this uh, predisposition to the ethnicity this is more associated with a, a keloid it is not that much associated with the hypertrophic scar so yes definitely c is also a true statement now what about d confined within the waters of the scar yes definitely that is the answer and tramsinol is the preferred treatment yes that is also a true statement okay so all the uh, of all the five options which we have over here so d is not false okay so we are talking about the hypertrophic scar it is basically confined within the boundaries of the scar so keloid is the one which is basically going beyond the boundaries of the scar but hypertrophic scar is confined okay so let us jot down the important differences between the keloid and the hypertrophic scar okay so let us just jot down the important differences they are very very important so let us kind of jot down so we have a hypertrophic scar and then we have a keloid so what about keloid? When does a keloid occur? So please understand the occurrence of the keloid. It is basically between three months to years. 
so basically after the patient has been subjected to a surgery it may take like three months or like from three months it may take like a couple of years so patient can even come to you with a keloid which basically started after one year of uh, he undergoing a surgery i hope you got this okay so this is something important what about the hypertrophic scar it usually occurs within days till three months so here basically the hypertrophic scar usually occur uh, just within days after the surgery but it can occur till three months of age okay so three months after the surgery yes it can occur i've already told you about this particular point very very important here there is an increased deposition of the collagen type 3 okay there is an increased deposition of the collagen type 3 what about in the keloid here we have an increased deposition of the collagen one and three okay now if we take about talk about our normal skin what is the type of a collagen which is present in our normal skin so please understand we have both collagen type one as well as collagen type three if i ask you the ratio what is the kind of a ratio of this collagen type one to the type three in normal skin can you please tell me what is the ratio of this collagen type one to the type three in the normal skin can you please tell me type one to type three what is the ratio in the normal skin that is 4 is to 1 this is again a very very important question so just like in the normal skin even in the keloid we have the presence of both collagen type 1 as well as the collagen type uh, 3 but what is the basic difference here as i have already told you in the kind of a hypertrophic scar this is basically arranged in an organized fashion this is arranged in the organized fashion but in basically a kind of a keloid this is basically disorganized disorganized or your mcqs will call it as a wavy pattern okay so your mcqs will refer it to as a wavy pattern i hope you understand this okay so this is a basic difference between these two things okay i hope you got this right okay now let us talk about uh, the other point so in this particular keloid if i just ask you uh, right so there is a kind of a predisposition so it is basically familial and it is predisposition to the race predisposition and what about this in the hypertrophic scar it is not familial and there is no predisposition to any particular race in the hypertrophic scar what about the treatment so please understand the preferred treatment to first we basically go for both we basically go for uh, intralegional triamcinolone injection okay but if at all the hypertrophic scar doesn't respond to this we can go for a primary excision okay now this is something which you need to understand if at all a patient with a hypertrophic scar doesn't respond then you can go for a primary excision and that is enough okay you can basically go for a primary excision but if at all the patient of a keloid doesn't respond to this then you will have to go for an excision you can go for an excision that is fine but along with this you cannot just only go for an excision along with this you also have to go for a maybe a compression bandage or a post-operative radiotherapy post-op radiotherapy now please understand there are a couple of mcqs which have been asked regarding this so please understand this particular point very very well so if at all you have a patient of a hypertrophic scar or a keloid in both you will prefer to go for a intralegional triamcinolone injection but if at all the patient of a hypertrophic scar responds it's good if it doesn't respond you can just go for a primary excision with the suturing that can be done but if at all there is a patient of a keloid which is not responding to the intralegional triamcinolone injection obviously you'll have to go for an excision but if you just leave it if you just go for an excision and you go for a primary repair there will be 100 percent recurrence in these particular patients so in order to prevent the recurrence you will have to go for this compression bandage or a post-operative radiotherapy to the site of the surgery that you will have to go for i hope you get this so along with this information you can basically try to answer the mcqs which have been asked so don't be under the impression that excision is contraindicated in the patients of a keloid that is not true obviously if at all patient is not responding to the transalone you will have to go for an excision but you have to do certain measures in order to prevent the recurrence okay so i hope you got this now let us talk about this particular question it is a very very interesting question okay so i want all of you to answer i can see that seven of you are over here now uh, it's kind of uh, 
uh, understandable because it is kind of clashing with the other YouTube sessions also. But I'm really sorry I couldn't take it at 6 p.m. today. That's why I have to take it at 8 p.m. So yeah, let's try to answer this particular question. Whoever is here, please do answer. Now, which of the following statements are true regarding the upper uni tract transitional cell carcinoma? So what I'm trying to ask over here. So you have a kidney and in the kidney what do you have you have a renal pelvis so i'm basically trying to ask you if at all there is a transitional cell carcinoma of a renal pelvis which of the following statements regarding it is true can you please tell me which of the following statements regarding it is true now the question uh, point number one is basically it can be diagnosed by the urinary cytology what do you think is it a true statement or is it a false statement so i'm just waiting for your answer guys uh, the option number one is basically that uh, it can be diagnosed with the urinary cytology do you think it's a true statement can it be diagnosed with the help of a urinary cytology? Is it a true statement? So yes, definitely, it is a true statement. Now, can you please explain it to me? Why is this urinary cytology helpful in diagnosing the, in these particular patients? Do you ever kind of do this urinary cytology in order to diagnose a patient of a renal cell carcinoma or something like that? Do you ever do this? No, right? Then what is in this urinary cytology? Why is it helpful for the transitional cell carcinoma? Can you please tell me? So urinary cytology. What is this urinary cytology? In this basically what you're doing is, you are basically collecting a urine specimen. You're basically collecting the urine and basically you are kind of examining this urine sample for a malignant cells. Okay, so what you're trying to do, you're basically trying to find a malignant cells in this urinary specimen. This is what you're trying to do. Now, if I ask you, is this like what is so special in this particular patient of a transitional cell carcinoma that you basically go for this urinary cytology do we talk about this in patients of a prostate carcinoma do we talk about this in patients of a renal cell carcinoma absolutely no so the main point is basically cohesiveness okay so there is something which is called as a cohesive Ness. What is this cohesiveness? This is basically a property of the cells to get adhered to each other. Now, the patients of a transitional cell carcinoma, whether it is of the bladder, whether it is of a upper urinary tract, whatever it is, these cells of a transitional cell carcinoma, these are poor cohesive. Okay, so they are poor cohesive, and because if they are poor cohesive, what will happen? They will basically be put down into the urine. And this is the reason why you can basically examine this particular urine and you can try to find the malignant cells. And that is how it basically helps in the diagnosis of a transitional cell carcinoma. I hope you got this. Okay. This is the reason why you are able to perform this uh, kind of a urinary cytology and diagnose a transitional cell carcinoma. Okay. I hope you got this. Now, let us talk about the next particular option. So, smoking is a risk factor. Do you think it's a true statement? Is smoking a risk factor for the transitional cell carcinoma? Do you think? Is it a true or a false statement? Option number B. Is it a true or a false statement? Can you please tell me? Is it a true or a false statement? Uh, yes, definitely. It is a true statement. Okay. So yes, definitely. Smoking is a very, very important risk factor for the transitional cell carcinoma. It is a true statement. Okay. Yes, it is a true statement. No doubt smoking is a one of the very, very important factors for the transitional cell carcinoma whether it is of a bladder or whether it, whether it is of a upper urinary tract okay moving on to the next option number c the treatment of choice is a radical nephrectomy is it a true statement okay so if at all there is a kind of a tumor arising from this renal pelvis where is the treatment of choice a radical nephrectomy can you please tell me what is the answer is it a true or a false statement guys can you please tell me i want your answer guys please please to answer is it a true or a false statement so Pranam, what do you think? Is it a true or a false statement? It is a true statement. Nephrectomy with cuff of bladder. Okay, very good. Very, very good. So no guys, this is not a true statement. What I've written over here, it is not a true statement. And only one of you was able to pick it up. So this is a false statement. Why? You will not have to go for a radical nephrectomy. So as someone of you have kind of very rightly said, um, Pranav has rightly said that you will have to go for a uh, nephrouretrectomy. Okay, nephro urethrectomy with cuff of bladder. Okay, very, very good. Okay, so this is basically the treatment of choice for the patients of a transitional cell carcinoma of the renal pelvis. I hope you get this. Okay, so it is not a radical nephrectomy. In the radical nephrectomy, you don't remove the entire ureter. You just remove the upper, like one third or upper two third of the ureter, basically till the renal pelvis. Wherever you can reach, you basically remove that part of the ureter. But if at all there is a transitional cell carcinoma, you have to remove the entire ureter 
along with the cuff of the bladder this is very very important i hope you get this okay so yes option number c is basically a false now let us talk about this option number d it increases the chances of the urinary bladder carcinoma so if at all there is a kind of a cancer in the renal pelvis will it increase the risk of a urinary bladder carcinoma is it a true or a false statement guys now i want i'm asking about option number d can you please tell me is it a true or a false statement so right option number d uh, is does it increase the risk of bladder carcinoma yes or no now please understand yes in fact it increases the risk of bladder cell carcinoma very very good okay so yes definitely it is also a true statement and what is the reason for this so as i have already told you that the cells of a transitional carcinoma they are poorly cohesive and because they are poorly cohesive they basically are drained into the bladder and in the bladder these cells can basically get implanted into the mucosa of the bladder and it can lead to the formation of a bladder carcinoma this is what is called as a downward spread of the tumor okay so that is a true statement and retrograde pilogram can be used for the diagnosing this particular condition so please understand what is this retrograde pilogram here what you basically do is you basically put your catheter from the bladder into the ureter and you push the dye out uh, into it and yes this can be used it is also a true statement one of the kind of a treatment options which we can go for like diagnostic procedures which we can do in these particular patients is retrograde pilography okay so it is not retrograde kind of a urethrogram it is not rgu you are not placing your catheter into the urethra basically you are taking it till the ureter and then you are putting up a dye inside the ureter and this is what is called is a retrograde pilography till the pi like the pilo means the pelvis so till the pelvis the dive has to reach okay so this is what is a retrograde pilography and this can be used in the uh, for the diagnosis of the uh, transitional cell carcinoma what what it will show it will basically show a filling defect okay so it will basically show a filling defect that is fine nothing great about it but yes it will be shown in this particular way. okay now let us move on to the next particular question guys so great now let us talk about this uh, again a pretty simple question which of the following statements are true regarding the sutures okay so quickly answer it guys so option number a is basically uh, monofilament sutures have less risk of infection is it a true or a false statement please answer whoever is online please 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 just put up all the answers okay so yeah monofilament sutures uh, has a less risk of infection okay so let's talk about the monofilament sutures what is having in the monofilament suture is that there is a single strand which is there and because there is a single strand the capillary action of this particular single strand it is less okay so uh right yes because there is less capillary action what is going to happen because of this less capillary action the spread of infection will be less that is a true statement okay please understand and what uh right somebody is saying to say about the crevices so what is happening over here there is a in the multifilament sutures you have these crevices so he is right basically so what can happen the bacteria can lodge in these crevices and this can basically increase the risk of infection with the multifilament sutures in the monofilament sutures we don't have that and at the same time we don't have this capillary action so because of this yeah the risk of infection is very less in the monofilament sutures right now multifilament sutures have a poor knot security is it a true or a false statement so what about the knot security is it true like uh, is it more with the multifilament suture or is it more with the monofilament suture can you please tell me so option number b guys can you please tell me what is the answer so the knot security is it more with the multifilament or a monofilament suture um okay right so okay so guys please understand this is a false statement okay it is a false statement okay yes it is a false statement why because uh, what is having over here in the multifilament sutures we have a multiple filament so the memory is less and that is the reason why the knot security is more this is basically an advantage of a multifilament suture when it compare it with the monofilament suture okay so let's kind of uh, say it again monofilament sutures less chance of infection but a multifilament suture it has a better knot security okay very very important now proline is used for the vascular surgery repair yes definitely it is a true statement so if somebody ask you what is the kind of a suture of choice which we use in the patients of a vascular surgery definitely the answer is proline okay so proline is the kind of a single suture which you will use in the vascular surgery now what is this aberdeen snot aberdeen snot is taken in the simple interrupted suture can you please tell me is it a true or a false statement i want all of you to answer about this d okay what about these aberdeen snot is it taken in the simple interrupted suture can you please tell me guys please answer uh, so maya has said that it is a true statement yes is it a true statement guys 
pranav is it a true statement yes please understand guys don't mess it up it is a direct line from your lovin bailey aberdeen's knot is not taken in the simple interrupted suture where do you take it you take it in a continuous suture okay so please understand aberdeen's knot is not taken in a simple interrupted suture aberdeen's knot so this is basically taken in the where it is taken can you please tell me it is taken in the continuous suture why what is the function of this why why do you take it because see understand what is continuous suture so at the end there is a knot that is fine and then there is a continuous suture like this okay and then at the end of the suture line you again take up a knot so if at all due to some reason due to any damn reason if at all this particular end knot okay so the kind of a kind of a tie which you had uh, kind of taken at the end of the suture line if at all it breaks or it something happens to this if at all anything happens to this what will happen the entire suture will open along its length are you understanding my point the entire suture will open along its length do you want this you don't want this so yes this is the reason why you have to take this aberdeen's knot at the multiple intermittent part so if at all even if this kind of a last part of the suture it if it gives away even if it gives away what will happen only this particular part of the wound will kind of open up only this particular part of the wound will open up are you understanding my point so this is very very important don't kind of mess this up aberdeen's knot it is taken in the continuous suture and if you answer and if you want to answer why why do you take this aberdeen's knot in the continuous suture it is basically to yeah to increase the security or basically yeah to make the kind of continuous suture more secure this is the reason why you take it i hope you get this guys okay so increase the security of the suture or to secure the suture line okay yes very very important it is direct line from lovin billy can be asked any moment of time okay it will be asked definitely when i don't know but it will definitely be asked it has already been asked in the neat ss part of the general surgery so yes it can definitely ask with you also right now let's talk about this monocryl suture is used for the subcuticular suture is it a true statement so yes guys it is in fact a true statement okay so please understand what is this subcuticular suture it, this is basically a suture which you base uh, basically take inside the dermis okay so when you whenever you take particular suture in the dermis you prefer to take it with a absorbable suture okay so monocryl is basically an absorbable suture and that is the reason you basically kind of use it in the subcuticular suture are you understanding my point so vicryl is also a kind of an absorbable suture but vicryl is a multifilament suture that is why you prefer monocryl because we have already seen that with the monofilament suture monocryl is a monofilament and that is the reason it will have less risk of infection and you don't want your subcuticular kind of suture line to get infected and that is why monocryl is the preferred suture for the subcuticular sutures i hope you got this okay no silk you don't take it for this silk is basically a non absorbable suture you don't you should not take subcuticular sutures with silk okay not advisable okay i hope you got this okay now let us move on to the next question afferent arteriole okay so basically afferent arteriole which you have in the glomerulus so i hope obviously you know this there is an afferent arteriole then you have your glomerulus and then you have an efferent arteriole so what i am trying to ask in here is that this afferent arteriole this is a branch of what so can you please tell me this afferent arteriole this is a branch of acute artery segmental artery interlobular artery in, uh, in, interlobular artery interlobular artery or a renal artery what is the answer guys a b c or d can you please tell me so vasudev is saying it's d is he correct guys can you please tell me what is the answer right so even is saying it's c who is correct guys can you please tell me this afferent artery or the afferent arteriole of the glomerulus this is a branch of what Whoever is online, please answer, guys. I want all of you to answer. Right. So this is a basic confusion which happens in the students, right? So please understand the answer to this particular question is in fact it is an interlobular artery. Option number D is the correct answer. Okay. So let us have a look at the arterial branches of the kind of a kidney. So these, this is basically a kind of a figure of a kidney, and here I am trying to demonstrate to you about all the branches of the kidney. Okay. Like the branches of the renal artery. So what do you have? you first have basically a renal main renal artery so to begin with what do you get you get basically a renal artery 
this basically renal artery divides into the segmental artery so there are the anterior segmental artery and there is a single posterior segmental artery okay so i hope you get this after this this is basically the first thing which happens then after this what happens there is a segmental artery segmental artery it is the kind of a uh, first division of the main renal artery from the segmental artery what happens the artery is given between the renal pyramids okay so between these renal pyramids the artery is given what is it referred to as it is referred to as a interlobar artery please understand this is an interlobar artery which is basically given between the renal pyramids then uh, from this interlobar artery what arises after this interlobar arteries we have a origin of the arcuate artery okay so from this what arises arises a arcuate artery and from this arcuate artery finally what arises is a interlobular artery okay so i hope you got this we have a renal artery then we have a segmental artery then after that it is basically given down into interlobar artery then arcuate artery and then finally interlobular artery and this interlobular artery is the one which basically gives you the afferent artery of the glomerulus i hope you got this so this can also be asked in arranging the sequence kind of a question in the aims so please kind of make sure that you understand this only kind of point of confusion is interlobar and interlobular so you have to understand that interlobar is between the renal pyramids and the interlobular this is basically the terminal branch of the renal artery i hope you got this okay so i'll just repeat it for you renal artery then the segmental artery interlobar artery arcuate artery interlobular artery and then the afferent artery i hope you got this guys okay let's move on let's talk about next particular question okay right so next question is basically which of the following statements regarding the immunosuppressant drugs mechanism of action is true okay so which of the following is true regarding the immunosuppressant drug mechanism of action now this is something also very very important okay so basically ragu is asking what about the efferent so what happens is basically guys uh ragu please understand what is going to happen this afferent artery will go inside the glomerulus and from the glomerulus will arise the efferent arteriole so efferent arteriole is not a branch of anything okay and this efferent arteriole will again basically combine and this will lead to the formation of a vein a renal vein so i cannot tell you what is the efferent arteriole is a branch of it is basically arising from the glomerulus okay so this kind of interlobular artery this gives rise to the afferent arteriole which gives rise to the glomerulus which gives rise to an efferent arteriole okay yes right okay now this is something very very important the we are talking about the mechanism of action of the immunosuppressant drugs uh the we are talking about the mechanism of action of the immunosuppressant drugs okay now uh this is something which is with the students always struggle with so that is why i'm trying to cover it uh, cover it over here so can you please tell me about the cyclosporin okay so this cyclosporin this is basically a example of a calcium urine inhibitor so the cyclosporin it's a calcium urine inhibitor can you please tell me how does it act does it act by uh, inhibiting the action of the interleukin 2 can't see what do you what do you can't see guys okay so it is very very small is it okay just a minute better now okay so what is the answer to this particular question a is true is it okay then what about uh, b zero limits inhibits the transcription of interleukin 2 is it true just stay with me guys i will basically revise your uh, okay ragu please understand both a and b are false because both a and b are switched together so please understand the action of zero limits this is basically inhibiting the transcription of the interleukin 2 and this uh, kind of a cyclosporin this is basically inhibiting the transcription of the interleukin 2 and this serolimus this is basically a mtor inhibitor this is a mtor inhibitor and and this is the one which is basically inhibiting the action of interleukin 2 please understand okay so there is a difference okay so both are kind of switched together both a and b are false statement i hope you got this okay both a and b are the false statement 
A is basically like cyclosporin. This is basically example of a calcineurin inhibitor and this is basically inhibiting the transcription of interleukin 2. And what about the serolimus? This is an mTOR inhibitor and this is basically inhibiting the action of the interleukin 2. Okay, I hope you got this right. Now, what about this? Alemtuzumab, it is a depleting antibody. Is it a true or a false statement? So, please understand. Yes, alemtuzumab, this is basically anti CD55. This is anti CD55. And this is the one which is, in fact, a true statement. This is basically a depleting antibody. Yes, and this is the one which is having a very, very high immunosuppressive activity. I'll tell you why, but just stay with me. I'll tell you why. Now, azathioprine. It is an anti-proliferative agent and a mycophenolate is an anti-proliferative agent, which is true. DNE. Are these two statements true? Can you please tell me, guys? Is DNE statement true? Please understand. Both these statements are true. Okay. So, yes, azathioprine and mycophenolate, both are basically an uh, anti-proliferative agents. I hope you got this. Okay. Both azathioprine and mycophenolate, both are the anti-proliferative agents. So please have a look at this particular kind of a figure. This is directly from your love and Billy, and this will basically make you understand how do the immunosuppressant drugs act. Okay. So I'll just walk you through it. So our first basically is, so what is basically immunosuppressant drugs? These are the basically drugs, which are basically preventing the, preventing the development and these are basically the drugs which are preventing the maturation of the t lymphocytes okay so how do they act to begin with we have these depleting antibodies so these depleting antibodies they can be anti thymocyte globulin atg is basically anti thymocyte globulin or alemtuzumab alemtuzumab as i have already told you it is anti cd55 fair enough then along with this you also have this co stimulatory blocker but that is fine if you want to remember it remember if you forget if you don't remember it that's also fine nothing great about it what you absolutely cannot afford to forget is this calcineurin inhibitors so what is an example of a calcineurin inhibitor it is a cyclosporin and tacrolimus i hope you got this okay so what is an example of a calcineurin inhibitor it is a cyclosporin and the tacrolimus so how do they act basically as i've already told you these calcineurin inhibitors they basically act by inhibiting the transcription of the t lymphocytes how do they act they act by inhibiting the transcription of the uh, sorry they inhibit the transcription of the interleukin 2 they are basically inhibiting the transcription of the interleukin 2 ka transcription ko rok dete hain calcium urine inhibitors what about this uh, then what do we have absolutely you cannot afford to forget these mTOR inhibitors what are the examples of the mTOR inhibitors it is the serolimus and the everolimus how do they act these they basically inhibit the kind of a intracellular signaling of the interleukin 2 okay so how do they act they basically inhibit intracellular signaling okay intracellular signaling of interleukin 2 okay then another important thing is this anti cd25 so this anti cd25 this is basically inhibiting the binding of the interleukin 2 to the T cells okay so these interleukin 2s they basically go to the kind of a T lymphocytes and they basically bind to the CD25 receptors so what is happening over here these anti CD25 antibodies they are basically uh, kind of preventing the attachment of the interleukin to this to CD25 so please understand one thing this interleukin 2 is a very very important thing which is basically responsible for the development of the T lymphocytes how we can prevent its action we can either prevent the transcription of the interleukin 2 how we can do that with the help of the calcineurin inhibitors we can prevent this interleukin 2 from binding to the T lymphocytes how we can do that by the anti CD25 uh, right drugs then if at all it has bind to the CD25, we can prevent the intracellular signaling of the interleukin 2. How is it possible? With the help of a mTOR inhibitor. I hope you got this. Okay. So calcineurin inhibitors preventing the transcription of the interleukin 2. Anti-CD25 preventing the attachment of the interleukin 2 to the CD25. And uh, mTOR inhibitors, they are basically preventing or inhibiting the intracellular signaling of the interleukin 2. This is how they act. And lastly, we have a very, very important drug, which is an anti-proliferative agent. What are these anti-proliferative agents? We have mycophenolic acid derivatives and the azathioprine. So these are the main immunosuppressive drugs which we use in our daily practice in every patient of a transplant. I hope you got this. Okay.
right this was very very important and i know that students basically struggle with this i hope it helped in giving you a bit of a clarity regarding the mechanism of action please go through them today itself then you will basically remember it okay so please after this particular session ends please try to go through it right now what about this the this is again a very very important table which is given in your love and billy this basically tells you about the most important side effects of the individual drugs okay so i'll basically tell you about these so yes corticosteroids you all know that how do the corticosteroids are not good for our uh, self so why because they basically lead to the hypertension dyslipidemia all those things you can go through that okay so these are all the side effects of the steroids so the uh, side effect of steroids they will basically present with the corticosteroids that is fine then you uh, the important drugs were cyclosporin and the tacrolimus okay so two of the most important drugs which we talked about was uh, this tacrolimus and the cyclosporin so please understand very very important okay so cyclosporin and tacrolimus they have few of the common side effects so what are the common side effects between this cyclosporin and the tacrolimus please understand nephrotoxicity hypertension and dyslipidemia so nephrotoxicity hypertension and dyslipidemia this is basically common to tacrolimus as well as cyclosporin common to both but if you are specifically asked about hirsutism and gingival hyperplasia you must have heard about this right so hirsutism and gingival hyperplasia this is a basically side effect of a calcineurin inhibitor but it is not present with both okay so we have a kind of a cyclosporin and tacrolimus both are the calcineurin inhibitors but it is mainly mainly associated with the cyclosporin i hope you got this okay very very important another important thing is this diabetes so another very very important side effect of a calcineurin inhibitor is the diabetes so please understand diabetes it is associated with the tacrolimus very very important mcqs guys please remember hirsutism gingival hyperplasia associated with cyclosporin diabetes it is associated with tacrolimus i hope you got this right now another very very important side effect of this mtor inhibitor so what is an important side effect of this mtor inhibitor please understand the very very important side effect of this mtor inhibitor is impaired wound healing so that is the reason why you do not give mtor inhibitors just after the surgery why because it will prevent the post operative healing of the patient that is why you do not give it just after the surgery i hope you got this okay so these are the few of the important drugs and the important side effects related to it you can go through this particular table it is also very very important but at least this you have to remember just repeat with me cyclosporin is associated with hirsutism and the gingival hyperplasia and the tacrolimus is the one which is associated with the diabetes both are the calcineurin inhibitors and another very very important side effect of the calcineurin and the cyclosporin is uh, cyclosporin and the tacrolimus is nephrotoxicity okay why why is it very very important because this these are the drugs which are very commonly used after the renal transplantation just imagine a scenario where a patient of a renal transplantation is suffering from a nephrotoxicity because of the immunosuppressant drugs which you are giving to these particular patients not a good thing right so yeah that is the reason why this is a kind of a limiting factor which Uh, basically sometimes hampers the use of these drugs in the renal transplant patients so just go to this particular table it is a very very important table that's why i kind of thought of mentioning it over here okay now let us talk about a bit of a simple question now okay so right now which of the following statements is true regarding the horseshoe kidney okay regarding the horseshoe kidney which of the following statement is true the ascent is basically restricted by the superior mesenteric artery can you please tell me is it a true or a false statement guys so ascent of the kidney is basically restricted by the superior mesenteric artery is it a true or a false statement can you please tell me yeah can you please tell me guys is it a true or a false statement it is a false statement yes definitely why because the ascent of the kidney is basically restricted by the inferior mesenteric artery okay it is basically restricted by the inferior mesenteric artery very very important okay so this is basically restricted by the inferior mesenteric artery very very important what about the isthmus the isthmus of the kidney basically lies at what level does it lie at the level of l2 l3 right so yes definitely this is also a false statement why because this basically lies at the level of l3 l4 
okay so please understand what is a horseshoe kidney this is basically a condition where the lower poles of the kidney are fused together and because of this what is going to happen when the kidney basically ascends from the uh, kind of its embryological development part that is the pelvis it ascends upwards and lies into the abdomen during the part of this ascent what is happening it is being restricted by the inferior mesenteric artery and the isthmus of the kidney basically lies at the level of l3 and l4 both are very very important in secures in itself okay now this is something an additional point which you might get so uh, uh, this uh, patients who have this horseshoe kidney are they at an increased risk of certain malignancy and if at all they are at an increased risk of malignancy are it at an increased risk of renal cell carcinoma or are they at an increased risk of a Wilms tumor can you please tell me C is false, D is true. Yes, definitely. Very, very good. C is false. So, the risk of a renal cell carcinoma in the patients of a horseshoe kidney, it is just the same as that of a general population. But if we talk about this Wilms tumor, definitely. The risk of the Wilms tumor in these particular patients is much more as compared to that of a general population. This is something which you need to remember. Okay, right. And what about the fifth statement? Most of these are asymptomatic. Is it a true or a false statement? So, what about the uh, statement number E? Is it a true or a false statement, guys? So, E is basically a true statement, okay? So, most of these patients are asymptomatic. It is an incidental finding in most of these particular patients. So, yes, definitely, most of these patients are asymptomatic. Very, very important, okay? I hope you got this. So, horseshoe kidney is a very important topic. Please kind of go through it. And yes, so important points are basically because of fusion of the lower pole, it is getting arrested because of the inferior mesenteric artery. The estimates is lying at the level of the L3, L4. Uh, it is not uh, most of the patients are asymptomatic incidental finding happens in most of these particular patients if at all the patient might develop a symptom patient might develop a urinary tract infection or a stone or something like that you just go for a like the symptomatic treatment you don't go for an operation cutting the stomach or something like that you don't go for that you basically go for a symptomatic treatment okay and this is an important point that it is an increased risk of a Wilms tumor in these particular patients but the risk of the renal cell carcinoma it is practically the same you are well aware of the ivp finding you get a flower vase bend of the ureter or you get basically get a shake hand sign yes that is fine and another important thing is you have to cut the isthmus only and only if you want to operate on the retroperitoneum so let's say if you want to uh, operate on some retroperitoneal tumor or you want to operate on some uh, kind of aortic artery aneurysm then you will have to go ahead and cut the isthmus of this particular patient but uh, otherwise you don't go and cut the isthmus why because if you cut the isthmus the lower poles of the kidney might undergo ischemic changes and that is not something which you want because they share the blood supply fair enough Let's move on to the next particular question. Which of the following parameters is taken into consideration while calculating the creatinine clearance? So we can calculate the creatinine clearance. How do you basically measure the GFR? So you basically measure the GFR with the help of a creatinine clearance. Okay. So uh, what is the formula for this? There is a Cockcroft Gold formula which we use to measure the GFR um, with the help of a creatinine clearance. So what I'm trying to ask you is what are the basically factors which are basically uh, which affect this particular calculation of the GFR uh, based on the cockroft gold formula. So can you please tell me for this you need to remember the cockroft gold formula. Okay. So even if you don't remember the entire formula that is kind of fine. But what you need to understand is that what are the kind of uh, elements of that particular formula. This absolutely need to remember. Okay. So I have the answer as D. Yes, definitely. This is one of the factors. Anything else guys? Mm, no sodium a even like no sodium is not a kind of a kind of a feature of this cockroach gold formula i'll just wait for a couple of seconds otherwise i'll show you the formula guys okay so what is the formula basically okay so the formula is basically 140 minus the age into the weight of the patient divided by the serum creatinine into 72 so i'll just write down because it is not uh, that much visible that well visible over there okay is it visible okay i, I think it is visible okay so what is basically formula so formula is basically 140 minus the age into the weight of the patient divided by the plasma creatinine into 72 please understand it is not the urine creatinine okay yeah so yes it is not the kind of a urine creatinine it is a serum creatinine that is why i have stressed on this particular point so what are the factors there is a age then there is a weight of the patient then there is a serum creatinine okay and then there it also varies based on the sex of the patient why because it is if at all you have to calculate in the males this is the formula that is the end of the formula okay so 140 minus the age into the weight divided by 72 into the serum creatinine this is the end of the formula if at all you want to calculate it for the males but if at all you want to calculate it for the females you have to multiply it by 0.85 okay so please understand 
So just repeat with me cockroach gold formula that is 140 minus the H into the weight of the patient divided by serum creatinine into 72. But if you want to calculate it in the females, you will have to multiply it by 0.85. I hope you got this. Okay, right. So this is basically a cockroach gold formula which we use in these particular patients. Right. Now another formula which we use to calculate the GFR is MDRD equation. Okay, so what are the factors? Okay, th this is basically a bit of a complex formula. Even if you don't remember it, that's completely fine. But what you need to absolutely remember is what are the factors which are kind of responsible or which affect basically the calculation of GFR. So the numeric for this is basically SARC. Okay, so what is this? This is basically the sex of the patient, age of the patient, race of the patient. So here race is also important. This is something which you need to understand. And then there is a again a serum creatinine okay so what is the formula just remember this sark okay so if you remember this sark you will be able to understand that what are the factors which are basically constituting or affecting the calculation of the gfr based on the mdrd equation so what is it it is sark that is sex age race and the serum creatinine i hope you got this okay so sex age race and the serum creatinine these are the factors which are basically uh, is affecting the calculation of the gfr in these particular patients okay so this is how you basically calculate the gfr okay fair enough i hope you got this guys right so this is basically the end of the session i hope you enjoyed it i hope it was a bit kind of uh, beneficial for you it was really kind of heartening because not many students attended today because i think uh, many kind of sessions are going on on this particular platform at this at the same time and that is why the live learners were a bit less but thank you so much for joining with me guys and it was indeed a pleasure just stay with me just stay with me for a couple of minutes i want to tell you something so you all know because of this coronavirus buzz we are basically organizing the free special classes so i will be taking up a 10 free special classes okay i will be taking up 10 free special classes and i will be taking up just like in a couple of days so here there is basically a schedule of whatever the special classes i have launched i hope you can see so i have launched a kind of a special classes on this radiological spotters for surgery part one radiological spotters for surgery part two and the radiological spotters related to surgery part three so these are the three special classes uh, which i have launched and these will be conducted on 23rd okay so 23rd of this particular month and the timing is basically at 2 o'clock then 3 30 and then uh, 5 o'clock okay so what you need to do if you at all you want to attend it you have to just click on the link below go to my page go to the special classes and you have to follow these particular classes so that whenever the classes are about to start half an hour before that you will get a message okay so if at all you are free you can basically come and attend it so these are the three special classes which i'll be conducted on 23rd on 24th I will be basically conducting a class on most important MCQs on sutures and the drains, then most important MCQs on the embryology of the urogenital tract and then 30 important MCQs on adrenals. So these are the classes which I will be conducting on 24th. The timing is the same from 2 then 3.30 and then 5 hour like uh, five o'clock okay so this will be conducted on 24th again if you want to attend them just go on the link below just go there and kind of uh, follow these particular classes so that you will get a message whenever i conduct it on 25th i have basically launched these two particular sessions till now 30 mcqs of the general surgery let's revise part one and 30 mcqs of the general surgery let's revise part two so these will be basically conducted on 25th okay so 25th of march this will be conducted the timing is again two o'clock and 3 30 now uh, i have still left two spaces blank two spaces or the two slots are still blank so if you have any other suggestion which class you want me to conduct please do put it up on the comment box so that i will be conducting that particular class if at all you don't have any other suggestion i will be launching my own particular classes whatever i think is important for you so please do consider coming and attending this these are basically the free classes which we are doing because most of the students are kind of grounded to the home so they can basically come online and learn from these particular classes okay right on hepatobiliary revision okay right so you basically want to a class on the hepatobiliary surgery right so ruin by resection is it so so hepatobiliary pancreatic revision okay so let's do a class on 30 most 30 mcqs on hepatobiliary system okay right so i'll be doing that 30 mcqs on the hepatobiliary pancreatic system so do on stones and on instruments too okay so i'll definitely consider that too doing on stones and an instrument i'll definitely consider that fair enough 
okay right i'll do that don't worry okay so basically maybe i'll do that 30 important mcqs on the stones i will do that 30 mcqs on stones fair enough done i'll do that okay so the two more classes which i'll be launching very very soon is 30 mcqs on the hepatobiliary pancreatic system and 30 mcqs on the stones if you still have any other kind of a uh, kind of a uh, topic just put it up i'll be conducting it next month okay at the same time what i want to tell you is that um, for the upcoming aims exam what i have devised it i have because most of the students basically ask me what are the most important topics related to the general surgery i many students basically ask me that okay so what i've decided it i will basically be conducting the kind of a session or basically a kind of i have launched a course which in which basically i'll be targeting about the most important topics in the uh, general surgery and i will be basically covering close to 400 topics in this particular course and this will be conducted in 13 sessions and each session will be two hours each so this particular course will be launching in end of this particular month and it will basically end in the next month so if at all you're interested into it you can definitely come and join our plus platform so this is just the upcoming course which i'm basically planning to launch on the plus platform so there are many other courses which are already going on please do consider because if you are basically liking these particular sessions, there is a very high probability that the courses which we are doing on the plus platform, you will definitely, definitely get benefited from it because they're much more structured and they're much more detailed than what we do on the YouTube. Okay. So if at all you wish to, that you feel that they might benefit you, please consider uh, becoming our plus subscriber and we'll be more than happy to connect with you on our plus sub platform. If at all you decide to join, you can consider using my promo code. My promo code is dr.pavan. If you use this, you will get around 10% discount. Okay. So you will get 10% discount if at all you use this particular promo code. Okay. So thank you so much guys. It was indeed a pleasure interacting with you. I hope you like this particular session. I hope it benefited you and hope to see you soon. Have a great day. See ya. Bye.